Good morning, church. It's good to see you all here braving the foggy elements this morning to worship with us. We're glad you're here. And all those worth worshiping with us from uh, Facebook Bible Church, we're glad that you're with us here as well. Uh, good to see some faces we haven't seen in a while. Uh, glad that you're back with us. Gary, Linda, really good to see you all. Glad that your travels have been safe. Uh, good to see you here this morning. We also have some visitors with us this morning. We're glad that you're here worshiping with us. And we have visitor cards at each of our foyer stations. What we would ask is if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to fill that out so that we have a record uh, of your visit with us. And also we can follow up with you if you would like. We're not going to be intrusive. We're not going to show up on your doorstep. Uh, but just if you, we would like to have a record of your visit with us. And uh, if you give us your email address, we can send you further updates as far as what's happening uh, during the week and upcoming weeks and upcoming events. And if you fill that out, or if not, uh, we have a special packet we'd like to share with you as well uh, that has information about our church. It also has a sermon in here from Pastor Tim. Man, that's good. It's not a sermon for me. If you're an insomniac, that would be work wonders for you. Um, but a special packet of information we'd like to share with you as well. Uh, as far as announcements, I believe all of our Sunday school classes have started back. Has Rita Weber's started back? Okay, that started back. As, oh, there you are. Perfect. Glad you're here as well. Glad everything is well with you health-wise, and uh, we're back ready to roll. So, well, I, th I got it. You got exposed. Okay. Well, we're glad that... You only got exposed, and that's as far as it went. So glad you're back. Glad the class is going again. So all of our Sunday school classes uh, are going uh, fast and furious. And this Wednesday, uh, youth group is meeting, right, Gabe? Okay. So youth group meeting this Wednesday from 7 to 8 o'clock. And then uh, TJ and Sarah Sartori have a small group that I believe meets here at the church at 2.30 uh, on Wednesday as well. So if you're looking for an afternoon small group, that would be great uh, to have you participate in that, and you won't have to travel in darkness. And also, uh, Rick DeLong, uh, has, they have their Bible study at Portable Room Number 2, uh, studying the book of Ephesians. It's, again, a small group study, uh, so if you'd like to attend that, uh, they would love to have you participate in that as well. I also want to thank you once again uh, for your faithful giving. Uh, through the end of last year, uh, you all really came through and uh, we finished on a real high note. And from what I understand this year, giving is off to a good start as well. So we're very thankful uh, for what the Lord has put on your heart uh, to give. And uh, we continue to thank you for your support, not only of our church, but our missionaries uh, and also what it means to our community. So as we move into our time of communion, I just want to share a little story with you. I promise there will be no singing. I know. Well, we're... I, I, you know, I just, I'll, I'll bring it back, you know, on occasion, every, on occasion, I will, I will bring that back, you know, I don't want you to get too spoiled, uh, but I do have a story. Uh, there was an attorney and a doctor, they were attending a, a dinner, a fundraising dinner in their community, and many of the high society uh, were going to be attending. So this doctor and attorney struck up a conversation, but as they were talking, the doctor kept being uh, interrupted with people that were coming up to him asking him about medical ailments or conditions that they were facing or, you know, someone they knew uh, had. And so this went on for about an hour. And so the doctor looked at the attorney and he said, you know, at, at events like this, and people just keep coming up and asking you for advice, what do you do? And the attorney said, that's easy. I give him the advice. And the next day, I send him a bill. <laughs> so the doctor was a little taken back by the approach, but the doctor thought, you know what, that's worth a try. So the next day, the doctor went into his office. He had business cards of all those who had, he had given advice to, and so he started writing out his bills, and he put them in an envelope, he stamped them, and he was going over to his mailbox to put them in for the uh, mail carrier to receive. He opened up his mailbox, but he saw a, a letter there for him. He opened it up. It was a bill from the attorney who gave him the advice to bill those who he was giving advice to. So what I want you to know is this. If you've trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're never going to get a bill. 
There's a debt that had to be paid, but that was already paid upon the Christ, cross of Christ. So you can go ahead and talk with him about anything. Ask him about any advice you would like. You can tell him everything you've ever done. You're never going to get a bill. You're never going to get an invoice. You're never going to have a debt collector coming after you. All you will receive is grace and love. And you can read all about it in the letter that he left for you. In fact, some of the contents of the letter would be this. Jesus said on that day, this bread represents my body that was broken for you, and you are to take and eat. And as often as you do so, do so in remembrance of me. In that letter, you will also read that Jesus said, this cup, this wine is my blood that was shed for you for forgiveness of your sins, the debt that I paid, that you can come to me and receive life and grace. Take and drink, and as often as you do so, do so in remembrance of me. Church, will you pray with me? Dear Lord, we thank you for tearing up the invoice, our invoice, upon that cross and allowing each of us to live debt-free and in your life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Am I all on? We're good. Yep, I'm on. Um, I, for one, love it when Richie sings, so I think we should uh, make it a requirement that when he's doing communion that he has to come up with some kind of a song. It's part of, like, we'll make it a performance contract. <laughs> yeah, the... Yeah, but uh, we'll have to discuss that in private because it's uh, too embarrassing to, to make known. Um, but do appreciate um, so much that. I, um, <clears throat> want to start in to John chapter 9 today. And that chapter really covers one story um, in the interest of trying to move a little faster so that we can finish the book of John before the second coming of Christ. Um, <clears throat> I divided it up into two messages, but then I decided that if I don't get all the way through, I'll just stop because um, I don't want to torture you, but there's so much stuff that I don't want to miss it um, either. In, in chapter number 8, uh, we saw that the Pharisees had gotten once again so frustrated with Jesus that they were ready to stone him because he identified himself with God. And that was just more they, than they could handle. Um, and I thought it's, it's interesting, like you can see these things, how they parallel in life, right? The, uh, don't confuse me with the facts. I've already made up my mind. And then when they can't answer the argument and they have no more words to say, then they get violent. <laughs> um, and uh, things really uh, haven't changed all that much. Um, he, and then he, he walked away. He disappeared into the crowd. But you see that when hatred takes captivity of the soul, that it blinds you in darkness to your own behaviors. And that's why we always have to choose love over hatred. It doesn't mean that people haven't hurt us and haven't wounded us. But when we choose hatred, what happens is that we become blind to our own problems. We're no longer seeing things um, clearly. And this most definitely um, happened to the Pharisees who were very religious but were living in darkness. They cared more about the rule, uh, the rules that they had come up with, um, and these rules, they had designed them to help people to keep from breaking the commandments. 
right? So they had the commandments of God, and these prohibitions and commandments were all there for the benefit of the people. That's what we have to always remember. When we see the commandments of God, we realize the things that he commands are for our good. And the things that he prohibits are to preserve us and to keep us from danger. But the Pharisees had thought, well, we, we don't want to break the, the, the commandments, so we need to come up with rules. So start off with 10 commandments and then uh, 633 other rules and regulations, and then they devised hundreds and thousands of pages of rules and regulations to make sure that you didn't break the rules and the regulations, and they got so focused on the rules and the regulations that they forgot about God. And that would be a horrible place to be religious and miss out on what it was all about. And Jesus continues to keep the pressure on them by exposing their hypocrisy and while bringing healing to the people. He stays uh, very much on mission. Um, I, I just I remember one thing, so I uh, don't want to forget because otherwise I'll forget and then I'll remember later. Um, I wanted to ask you that because we're doing a lot on Facebook Live and YouTube, uh, that when, we, when you hear the music start, I want to ask you to please hold any conversation out in the foyers. Now, if there's something very urgent, like a sale on cauliflower at HEB that must be discussed before church, um, have those discussions out there. Because what happens is the, the high-tech uh, audio-visual system that we have, my iPhone, uh, picks up all of the sound. And so when you're having a conversation back there, because the camera is back there, it picks up the sound from your conversation and not the band. And so that's just a little issue that's been coming up. And we are having hundreds of views on these things. I found, I got a message last week that a whole um, training battalion of the National Guard in Missouri was watching our sermon. I said, oh, no. Oh, I, I should have been nicer. But, um, I mean, that could have been the one week I chose to be nice to everybody. But, um, but we get people who are listening from all over. So we just want to make it a good experience for everybody. And I'm not saying don't have conversation or community. I'm just saying it would be very helpful if you would have that. And then when you're ready to um, come on in. And, um, and so I uh, just want to make that comment before I forgot. So let's look at John chapter number 9. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Well, Father, I, there's so much here, and I, just, I want to yield my mind, uh, my heart to you and to your indwelling presence, that you might have liberty to speak through me, that I would know what you want me to say and when to stop, and that I would just have boldness and, and, and yet tenderness. And I pray that each heart here who's here in, in the building or watching on Facebook or later on YouTube, that that this message would, would go and impact. And Lord, that we wouldn't just hear with understanding, but hear with hearts ready to respond. Lord, that, that there would be hearts of uh, repentance and surrender and action. That there would be, Lord, a, uh, in each of us a burning desire to experience your transforming power uh, day by day, moment by moment, as we wait for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, um, uh, here, um, there's so, so many little things and questions that kind of come at us. And one of the things that I was looking at was, you know, the, the source of grief and pain, the source of sickness. Um, it's just not a, it, it's not just an intellectual question, 
but an emotional and spiritual question. Why would an all-loving, all-powerful God allow people to suffer? Uh, when I was serving uh, in Buddhist countries, I did quite a bit of studying trying to understand what was going on, and, and the Buddha, uh, that was what led him away. He had been a prince in uh, northern India and uh, was trying to figure out like the answer to suffering. And so he abandons everything, his family and uh, everybody, and goes out in the search uh, for understanding uh, uh, the meaning of suffering. Um, it's interesting that at the end of his life, there's a statue of Buddha, and you'll see him like this. And uh, it was Buddha saying to his disciples, don't follow me, I don't know the way. And so what they did was they made a whole religion um, out of it, and all the thing was about how do we get rid of suffering. And the answer to in Buddhism about getting rid of suffering is to get uh, rid of attachment and desire. But see, God, the creator and sustainer, doesn't tell us to get rid of attachment or desire or emotion or feeling. He designed us for those things, but he wants it to operate within a healthy realm of, of, of living in his presence. And so when we look out, we say, well, why is there suffering? Because God could have stopped this. But then... He chooses not to sometimes. And we don't always understand. I, I don't think there's any easy answer to that question. I have been amongst people who anytime someone was sick, they had a surefire formula of how to get rid of that sickness and get instant healing. And it, and it, and it works uh, once in a while. Um, but... There is no surefire formula. And what you're going to see as we go through is that when Jesus does healing, there's no formula. He does it different almost every single time because he's not interested in us understanding formulas for how to make life work. He's interested in us entering into a relationship that is responsive to him and to see that even though there's no easy answer that we can trust him because he walks alongside of us. And then he comes and he finds a man who is born blind. And the first thing that struck me was the bo man born blind was doing nothing to find Jesus. Jesus was looking for him. Back in the day, we used to have a, a lot of bumper stickers, and then we had this thing that said, I found Jesus. Do you guys remember that one? The old people, they'll remember that back when bumper stickers were still cool. I remember I saw that. I found Jesus, and then I, there was another one, a Jewish one, and it said, uh, we never lost him um, or something. I found, yeah, you know, but uh, uh, bumper sticker theology is cute, but it's not real, real, real super good. Um, he, 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 what we really see is that I didn't find Jesus. He found me. And here was a blind man with no ability to even do anything for himself, born blind. And Jesus intentionally causes his path to interact with the man who was born blind. And then they say, well, whose fault is this? And then we see God's eternal purpose in the pain of our human existence. Rabbi, who sinned? Evidently, the disciples had somewhere been taught through their Judaic upbringing, that suffering was a direct result of human sin. And this is true of most of us. We're almost always looking for someone to blame, as long as it's not ourselves. Amen, that's good. Yeah, yeah that's good. No, we, it's just instinctive. Now, this last week, I was doing one of my favorite things, and I, I probably had, uh, I don't know, close to 20 hours of counseling in one week, which could, which could make a Baptist drink, I'm telling you. 
Um, anyway, I'm sitting there and I'm trying to figure out how to handle and resolve conflicts and all these multidimensional things. And finally, I was just sitting there praying. I said, Lord, show me what's the saying. And this is how it came out. Would you rather be right or reconciled? And so that's what I told him. I said, well, you want to be right or reconciled? You decide. Because you can have one or the other. But see, we just like think it's so important to know who do we attribute this suffering to. And so they're coming at him. Um, they think there's a direct connection between some sin and, su uh, and suffering. And, and I could say, well, that's obvious, right? Because there is a direct connection between some sin and some suffering. If you drink too much over and over and over again and you have cirrhosis of the liver, well, then you can say, yeah, I see that connection. Um, it, you know, if you smoke three packs of cigarettes a day for 40 years and you get lung cancer, well, you can say, well, you know, yeah, I made a choice there and that wasn't the healthiest choice, so we can see that connection. But more often than not, we don't see... Uh, Sin A resulting in B disease. I, I had to, I struggle with this. Like when I was diagnosed with Parkinson's, I'm, I'm sitting there one time and, you know, the whole process was just exhausting and frustrating. And, and you know, there were times when I just would cry in a doctor's office like, you know, gosh, you guys, you know. I have been poked and prodded and, and, and just no, no answers. And, I, and then finally they're like, okay, this is what you got. I'm like, well, why me? Well, what did I do? Because that's our instinct. Who, who's to blame for this one? Could this at least be genetic and I could blame it on my parents? I need someone to blame. Instead of responding and saying, instead of worrying about who to blame, how does God want to be glorified in this? You see, our instinct is to immediately seek to escape the suffering. Instead of saying, how does God want to be glorified in this? They're asking him if someone, the man sinned in the womb, how, how does that even happen? Was it the parents' fault? Who, who's to fault? And then Jesus says, it was not that this man sinned or his parents. He wasn't saying that they didn't have it all wrong. But some suffering seems to be a random event. He doesn't even address the specifics of this case. He said, man, it wasn't the blind man that sinned. It wasn't his parents in this case that sinned. The relationship between sin and suffering is real, but it's very subtle. In fact, one of the most unique ironies of all in the world is that much of the suffering we endure as Christians comes not as a result of sin, but as a result of doing good. You have heard people who have sarcastic tendencies say things like, does no good deed go unpunished? Because sometimes that's just how it feels. But you see, friends, this world which was created to function justly and perfectly is now a dysfunctional planet. It's filled with misery, natural disaster, disease, and death. God did not create the world this way. But we've corrupted it through sin. The scripture affirms the fact that we are all affected by the presence of human evil. You don't have to look hard to find it. Last week, you know, my, my sweet dear mother, you know, God rest her soul, um, she had this like very altruistic personality and uh, she would just say, oh, I just believe everyone's good. And she, that made her a great school teacher, you know, um, but 
everyone's good. Just see the good in everyone. And my dad was just the opposite. Something's going on there. Very suspicious. Um, so they made a good group, right? Um, but um, last week, we saw that Jesus himself was going to them and saying to these Pharisees, he said, you are of your father, the devil, and you do his will. So we're looking at it and saying, listen, we're born again and alive to God. And when we look out on the world, you know, sometimes we're just shocked by the evil. But I'm sitting there going, why are we shocked? There are a great multitude of people out there who still do the will of their father, the devil. He's only our father, God in heaven. Yahweh is only our father by birth. And that's why we must be born again, because that's the only way we can get a new nature, the only way that we can shed our ties to our original father, the devil, because we were all born in sin. And so, he calls us, friend, that our minds and our bodies to recognize our minds and our bodies don't always function as they were perfectly designed to do. That is why we are called to remember to walk in the Spirit so that we will not fulfill the lustful desires of the flesh. That we recognize that there is no mandate that we respond to every impulse that we have. Because some of those are healthy and some of those are unhealthy. We've all been affected by it. Our emotions, which God created in us as a source of joy, can become a source of pain and hindrance to us. Everywhere, humanity reflects the weakness of the fall. In the case of this man born blind, Jesus is emphatic that his blindness is not the result of his sin or his parents' sin. And you might be wondering, well, why did the disciples ask if the man's own sin could have caused his blindness since the birth? I don't know where that came from. But, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. You see, the man's blindness is not a meaningless disaster. This doesn't mean that God caused the blindness, but it does mean that God often does overrule the disasters of life in a fallen world. It is an opportunity. God is going to manifest manifest his power and character through the suffering of this one man. And so we need to stop, and instead of trying to figure out who is to blame, just live in simple surrender to say, Lord, here I am, and I'm in this difficult circumstance, or someone I love is facing a great challenge. We surrender this all that your works might be displayed in me. How transformative would that be? We cannot erase the hardships that we go through. We cannot erase even the ways that we have been used or abused or hurt. But we can say, Lord, here I am and I'm surrendered even in my woundedness, my illness, in my hurt. And my only desire is that the works of God might be displayed in me. That, friends, would transform us. Because the worst thing that can happen to any of us is to begin to live life as victims of our circumstances or victims of other people's evil intent. And have no doubt there are people with evil intent. 
But even in this, I can live as a surrendered vessel to say, Lord, I don't really like this Parkinson's or I don't like this whatever you've got. I don't like this deafness. I don't like this blindness. I don't necessarily like what I'm facing, but I surrender to be a vessel in which your good works might be displayed. And now, despite what comes at me, I am free. We certainly understand why things happen, and, and we certainly should be careful that when we see people who are suffering or ill or trials, that we don't immediately go on a sin hunt to determine the cause of illness. <laughs> now, part of, you know, part of why I'm so messed up and demented is because of uh, some of my experiences. But listen, I, I'll just never forget, and I've shared it with you before, like people would come up to us in, in way, way back when, and they'd say, like, if you were sick, they'd like, have you confessed all your sins? And I said, oh, yeah, both of them, yeah, yeah, both. Um, yeah, right? It, it, think about it this way, friends. If God were interested in zapping us or causing us great trial and tribulation because of any sin, then this would be a very empty building. But that's not his heart's desire, right? Because Jesus didn't come to condemn the world that through him they might be saved. So release yourself from the responsibility of trying to figure out what sins everyone has caused and remind them of who they are. Verse number four, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As Jesus looked at a blind man who had never seen light, he received in his heart a signal from the Father telling him it was time to act. Jesus felt a sense of urgency. Time is short, he says. The cross is before me. There will be no more time to work. And with this clear sense of urgency, Jesus moves to do what must be done in the blind man's life. I hope that instead of letting yourself become overwhelmed by despair of the events of the world that we live in, that you will just simply get a new urgency and say, this is the time to act. This is the time for me to shed my selfish ambitions and become a vessel that is in constant pursuit of the king and his kingdom because time is short. And we are light in darkness. He says, I, I, I have the works that he gave me to do in the day. Verse 5, he says, and as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I mean, this isn't the first time that he uses this expression. He understood that he was sent to bring light into the world, a world of spiritual darkness. Before him was a man in literal darkness, and it was time to bring light into his world. Matthew 5, 14 says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Delane was using, huh? Yeah. Isn't that interesting how that works? Jesus is saying, listen, I'm the light of the world, but what he's, he's prophesying into the life of the believer, he says, now, you are the light of the world. He is the light, but he puts that light in us when we receive him as our life. And now, as Delane said, and we were saying, now let your light shine. That our lives are to be lived on a mountaintop, if you will. But I fear that many of us have forgotten the admonition and we have allowed a basket, a basket weaved by our own selfish pursuits to hinder the expression of that light. 
It's time to bring light. Verse 6 and 7 says, And having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with saliva. And then he anointed the man's eyes with mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now, it's very interesting that there is obviously no formula for how he heals. Every, every healing is done in a different way. Uh, he, he's interested in more than this man just receiving a physical sight. He wants to draw him into a deeper relationship. He cares about the man and wants him to be physically whole, but he has a, a deeper yearning that he would be spiritually whole. When God created mankind, he did it from the dirt of the earth. And here he does what might seem a little disgusting. Now, I'm not sure that my Blue Cross Blue Shield will cover uh, this kind of healing, <laughs> right? <laughs> Spitting in the dirt and making some mud. You'd be like, well, uh, thankfully he was blind and didn't realize what's going on. <laughs> I, I, I listened to this strange piece. Oh, I listened to a lot of strange podcasts and stuff. I listened to a guy that was an economist that was talking about the word disgusting and what makes something disgusting. And, and I thought, I've eaten a lot of disgusting things over the days. But uh, someone spitting and making mud and then thinking about putting it on my eyes wouldn't necessarily be, you know, the most instinctive thing to do. But yet Jesus spits in the dust, makes some mud, and anoints his eyes. And then he says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Which means sent. And think about this. This guy's still blind. And Jesus sends him on a journey that everything I could read must have been very difficult. Walking up and navigating different rocks and, 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 and trails. No doubt that in his journey to the, the, to the brook, the pool, he would have to ask for directions. How would he even know what direction he was going? He would need help. He could easily fall in some of the ruts along the road. It was a difficult journey the Lord sent him on in search of his sight. But his going was evidence of his faith, and he washed, and he was healed. A beautiful example of what faith is and what faith isn't. You see, many times we can get confused and think that faith is me wanting something to be true. That's not faith. That's uh, self-will. Faith was him hearing Jesus say something, getting up and acting on what Jesus said. Faith is my receptivity to God's activity. Faith is my responsiveness to what he directs in my life. And so when we say we're people of faith, we're saying, yes, I hear and I receive and I respond. And so he heads out. And then in verse, um, um, verse number 8 through 13, uh, the neighbors and those who had sent him before as a, uh, had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? And some said, it is he. And others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, well, then how are your eyes open? And he answered, and the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. And so I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? And he said, I don't know. So they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. All this blind man knows is the man who healed him was Jesus. That's all he knows. 
That goes to show you that you don't have to have a degree from seminary in order to be born again. All you have to do is be willing to hear, receive, and respond. And that's good news for everyone who's here and everyone who hears this. You say, well, what do I have to do in order to be a child of God to live in his love? You receive, you hear, you respond. It's that simple. Do I need to know all of the answers and the deep theological questions? Let me tell you this about the deep theological questions. That theologians have been discussing, arguing, dividing, separating, and uh, making new denominations about these issues for the last 2,000 years, and I suspect will continue to do so until Jesus returns. So I wouldn't worry too much about all of those things. I enjoy studying some of those things, but listen, all you need to know is Jesus is who he says he is. Verse 14 through 16, and then I'm going to stop. Promise. Now, it was Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud. Uh Uh-uh. Did you hear that? What is the bad word here? Here is the trigger. Warning, warning. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisee asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was a division among them. I just love the simplicity of it. All he knows is what happened to him. Listen, you want to be a wonderful evangelist? Throw all of your formulas in the trash. Quit trying to sell people Jesus. We had it. I went through all of the programs. I went through the four spiritual laws and the Romans road. I got them all down, and I could sell Jesus anywhere in the world. Most of the time, people weren't transformed. Do you know what people need to hear? What Jesus did for you. That's all you need to know. They come to him and said, hey, wait a second, uh, this can't possibly be true. But you know what? I know it's true. I, I, I know what happened to me. He never complicates anything. He doesn't go into these deep discussions. He said, uh, I mean, he made some mud. He put it on my eyes. He sent me to the pool. I washed, and now I see. That's simple. But you got to see that Jesus had deliberately chosen this Sabbath day to heal this man, to bring life to him, and to poke his finger in the eyes of the Pharisees. Because this is religion at its worst. When you start to care more about your rules and regulations than you do the healing of a man born blind. He spat on the ground. Now, you say, well, why were they upset, Pastor? Well, you know, we could go into, you know, a 30-minute explanation about the different laws, and I'm not going to do that to you, but he broke the law three different ways, man. You weren't allowed to spit on the Sabbath because that was considered work. You weren't allowed to spit in the mud and and make mud because that was considered work. Uh, He weren't allowed to heal. I mean, they had these ridiculous rules. I mean, you can read this stuff today. So they had a rule that if a man was found with a broken leg on the Sabbath, can't heal him. You can make sure that nothing worse happens, but you can do nothing to correct it on the Sabbath. And Jesus is saying, what is wrong with you people? Not working on the Sabbath was purposeful, intentional, but was never meant to be more important than people. And their conclusion, despite seeing a man who was healed, who was born blind, something no one else could say had been done, he's a sinner because he doesn't keep my rules. You see... 
important lesson for us is just to remember that even if we have certain rules and preferences in our lives, that we don't attribute them to everyone else and con condemn someone who doesn't quite see it the way we do. Because we can have rules or guidelines or preferences in our own life that are important for us and directed by the Spirit that may not apply to everybody. And then the other group says, man, well, how does a sinner heal people born blind? And so there was a division. And the division remains even to this day. So, conclusion. I hear the roar of the crowd. Everyone who was asleep just woke up with those powerful words. Conclusion. Wow. Begin to see every challenge as an opportunity for the works of God to be manifest in your life. We are the vessels of his life. And we are never promised a life free from trials and tribulations and hardship. And yes, we find some distorted, weird comfort in trying to figure out who we can blame for our suffering instead of saying, listen, this is a divine opportunity for the good works of God to be revealed in me, and that's why I'm here. No matter what we face, pleasant or unpleasant, in my persecutions, in my sufferings, in my trials, when people begin to see the good works of God manifest, he is glorified, and I am not a victim, but a surrendered son and servant of the Almighty. And then remember, friends, there is no formula for healing. We know God can and does at times choose to heal divine and manifest his power in that way. And I frequently pray for it. And I have seen it and witnessed it and testified to it. But I also have many, many times when I prayed in deep faith for the healing and restoration of one who was not healed physically. And I don't make assumptions about telling God what he needs to do, how he needs to do it, and when he needs to do it, because my understanding is quite finite. Faith was evidenced by his obedience to Jesus' instructions. And so as a people of faith, we remember that faith is not presumption, imposing upon God what I will. Faith is me hearing the word of God and responding to the word of God, receiving and following through. If you're here this morning or you're listening to this online somewhere and you don't know for sure that the light of the world has come into you to make you the light of the world, that you don't know that your sins are forgiven and that you are a beloved child of God, my invitation to you today is to say, yes, Jesus. I believe that you died on that cross and you were buried and you rose again to give me newness of life, to make me righteous. And by faith in what you have done, by grace through faith, I receive now the gift of eternal life. I confess that you are the Almighty, the Lord, and I surrender myself unto you to become a vessel your dwelling place that looks at everything as an opportunity for you to be revealed in me. And so, my friends, every day, from here forward, I begin to look for the divine appointments that directs me to the blind 
not worrying about some deep theological question, but simply say, this is what Jesus has done for me and my life is an opportunity to be revealed in me today, tomorrow, for you. And this is an incredible privilege for us. Father, I, I pray that you not, just let it be, so let it be. I ask in Jesus' name.